in, in your way. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Come on, and the people say, Amen. And the people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please take your seat. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm glad to be in church this morning. I'm glad to see every one of you. Before we go into, you know, the word of God, just to announce, uh, Sister Buki celebrated the one year uh, transitioning into glory of our Father yesterday. Some of us were there to celebrate with her. So when next you see her, thank God for her. Pray for her in your closet that the Lord will continue to strengthen her and the family in Jesus' name. Um, one of our other brothers is also strong, so you can also give him a call after to, to encourage him so that he will quickly get up from that bed. Praise God. Hallelujah. So this morning, and for the next one or two Sundays, I don't know how long, we are going to be speaking on the message. And it's going to be a teaching also. It's a message, but it's also going to be a teaching titled, A Life on Fire for God. A life that is on fire for God. A life that is burning for God. Hallelujah. Listen to me, friends. As we go into this teaching this morning, I want you to listen very closely. And this is important. Why? Because God's desire is for us not just to be his children, but to be zealous children. Hallelujah. Amen. To be what? Zealous children of God. Children of God whose lives are on fire. Praise the Lord. I'll give you an example. I don't know where you grew up or how you grew up. But I remember growing up that our parents, I mean my, my mother then had a business that we could help her with as children. And she was always very happy. Whenever the children, any of us, whenever we took an interest in our business. Do you understand what I'm saying? Imagine if you, have, if you are a parent and you have a business. And your children pick up an interest in your business. How do you feel? You'll be glad. You are doing that business. That's where you get the money to take care of them. Then you also show an interest in the business. You'll be happy. You'll be elated. You'll be glad. And whether you try to hide it or not, the child that shows more interest in your business will win your favor. Am I correct? Am I correct? Brother Ayo told us story. So, uh, Ayo, I've not taken your permission to tell your story, but, you know, uh, since I'm already here, and I've already mentioned your name. But he told me, and a few of us, the story of the, a business that his mother ran when they were growing up. And it was very lucrative. And, you know, I told him, to him, he said, because I think you are all boys. Yes. One, just one girl. Oh, okay. He said, I didn't know about the girl. But at least I know a, a number of his brothers. You know, it's the kind of family that you don't go and beat their younger one. The number of boys that will come out to fight you. No matter how strong you are, you will make your time because you'll be tired. They say the youngest one should fight you first. You fight, fight. When you are getting tired, they say, okay, now that one should go back. You remember how it was when we were growing up? And you know, the mother started a business. And some of the older ones, some of his brothers, including himself, took interest in the business. So much so that some of them knew the business inside out. Do you understand what I'm saying? How do you think the mother would have felt? Very proud and very happy. Let me tell you something. It's the same way with God. When we become children of God, we are not supposed to be children of God who always come to make demands on God. We are supposed to be children of God who take interest in the things of God. And it is when we take interest in the things of God that we say we are zealous, we are passionate, our lives is on fire. It does, to be on fire does not mean you are hyperactive, no. Many times the things, the words that we use as believers are misinterpreted. We think when we say a man is on fire for God, it means that he's hyperactive, he's everywhere, he's running all over the place, he's making noise, no. It simply means that he has taken interest in the things that matter to God. Am I making sense to you? He has taken an interest in it. Imagine there are two brothers. They are in school. Whenever they come home, when one comes home, 
He says, Mommy, Daddy, this is the long list. I've written the list of what I want. And he gives it to Mommy or Daddy. And he walks away. Playing football with the friends, going out to see all the people he wants to see. Then a day to his departure to school, he shows up and says, Daddy, how far with the money? You know that's how some of us are. They say, so Daddy, how far with the money? Get it, get it out. Get it sorted. That's your work. Why are you my daddy if you cannot provide? That's one son. Imagine a second son. He comes back. He also has a list. But he does not present the list. He says, Daddy, they say, why are you home? Uh, they say, I need to get some things and all. Okay, how long are you going to be around? I'll be around for one week. Daddy says, okay. By the following morning, he gets up before everybody he has cleaned the house. He has gone into the kitchen, although he's a man, he has, a, a boy, he has cleaned the kitchen. If the parents have a shop or they have a business, he has gone there, he has cleaned the shop, he has set everything, and he does that every day for the one week that he's around. On the day when he's about to leave, will he get what he wants? Will mommy be angry and say, no, I'm not going to give you anything? In fact, she will go out of her way to say, ah, this is a good son. Am I correct? Why? Because the son has taken an interest in what is important to the parents. That's how it is. Hear me, friends. It is the same way with God. Many believers have been wrongly taught in our days. We have been wrongly raised as believers. And what, do they, what have people told us? They say, just go to God. He's a good God. You know when the Americans stand, they say, Our God is a good God. Our God is a God of blessing. Our God. And we say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just, just ask him for blessing. And he will bless you. And we start asking. And we are shocked that he does not give us anything. So many times we are confused. We say, God is not real. He is real. You are the one that does not know how to relate with him. You must take interest in what is important to him. When you take an interest in what is important to God, more than the blessing you are asking for, He will give you. More than your mind can fathom, you will receive. I'm telling you the truth. So this morning, I want to start a teaching for the next one or two Sundays on this message, on this title, a life that is what? On fire for God. A life that has taken an interest in what is important to God. Let's go to the scriptures, Romans chapter 12, verse 11. That is going to be our text. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. And I want all of us to pay attention to them. Hallelujah. Amen. When you show commitment, when you show an interest. So what does the Bible say? Everybody want to read. Yes. Yes. You see, there are three phrases there. What's the first phrase? Not slothful in business. What does it mean to be slothful? To be lazy, to be lazy yes. Stretch it a bit. Slow. To be slow. to be slow, yes. Can you use more interesting words? To be sluggish. Thank you, sir. To be sluggish. I don't know how you grew up. I remember growing up. My mother was a tough woman. Very loving, but also very tough. If my mother sends you on an errand, she's watching you. And those days when she was much younger, she was very fast. So my mother would say, go and get that thing. If you sluggishly get up from your seat, before you take three steps, she will catch up with you. And you know what we call a bar? What do they call that thing in English now? Help me. So that I can explain it to Joseph and uh, the other people. The Yoruba people, the Yoruba mothers, they call it a bar. It's a slap on the back. She will move very fast and give it to you. She will say, stop moving sluggishly. At first we thought, oh, this woman was so, so wicked. Why would she beat me like that? I've not done anything wrong. But you know, after a while, all of us, we start being sluggish. We cannot be sluggish because we have attached it to pain. Somewhere in our subconscious, we have attached sluggishness to pain. Do you know that also, as we now grow in life, we cannot be sluggish. Because in the real sense of it, a man that is slothful and sluggish will have pains in his life. He will not achieve much in his life. He will fail. 
A student that is sluggish, that does not study early in the semester, towards the end of the semester, he wants to read five textbooks in two weeks. He cannot pass as well as he would have passed if he started studying earlier. Am I making sense to you? Yes, sir. The Bible says, do not be slothful in business. Do not be a sluggish person. Don't be slothful. So if you are not slothful, what's the next phrase? Fervent. Fervent. What does it mean to be fervent? To be on fire. To be active. To be alive. To be agile. To be fast. Now, to be fervent in spirit. To be active. To be alive. Not sluggish. These two things refer to the third one. In what? Serving the Lord. So when you are serving the Lord, you must not be slothful. You must not be sluggish. When you are serving the Lord, you must be fervent. You must be on fire. A life that is on fire for God. Is that how your life is? Is your life on fire for God? Let me tell you something, friends. One of the things that brings the greatest blessings into the life of a Christian is to serve God. Fervently. It brings the greatest blessings. And do you know also, not only does it bring great blessings, it brings the most permanent blessings. You know some blessings are transient. You enjoy it and it's gone. Am I making sense to you? Imagine take you, I give you a bottle of Coke. I have served you something. Maybe you like to drink Coke. And I give you a bottle of Coke. How long will it take you to drink it? You will say thank you. But frankly, in five minutes, you are done with the bottle. You will enjoy it. But on the enjoyment, imagine I give you the key to a car. How long would you use a car? The bottle of Coca-Cola is one, is five minutes. A car, how long would you use it? Just put a year, put some number of years to it. Three years, five years. So we say five years, you know. And that's wonderful. That means it's a bigger blessing, as it were, than a bottle of Coke. Am I correct? Imagine I give you the key to a house. How long can you live in a house? You can live there all your life. So it's a better blessing than the car. Am I correct? Am I correct? Am I correct? That is the way it is. Some blessings are higher than others. I'm teaching you the truth of the Christian life. Many times, what we rush for and fight for are the Coca-Colas. Five minutes blessing. And once you get it, we begin to prance around. <laughs> Can you see the bottle of coke? You, not knowing that you have not received much yet. The key to the car is waiting. The keys to a house is waiting. And let me tell you, in the Christian life, one of the things that brings the greatest blessings to you is your service to God. So you must understand how to serve God to get that blessing. You want to not serve God to be blessed, it is to be on fire for God. That is, you must not be slothful in that service. You must not be sluggish in that service. You must not be careless in that service. Listen to me. We hear a lot about serving God, but we don't hear a lot about how to serve God. There is a way to serve God, to get His blessing. And that's what we are talking about, you know, on this teaching and this series. Let me read for a minute. God desires that we are zealous in our service to Him. It is not enough to just serve God, but we must serve Him with zeal and deep commitment. Let somebody say zeal. zeal. I can't hear you. Say zeal, zeal. And, deep and deep commitment. I can't hear you. Say deep commitment. deep commitment. God wants us to serve Him with zeal, fervently, and with commitment. So don't think that you can serve God anyhow. I'll give you another example. Imagine you are in the workplace. Two people were employed in the workplace. They were put on the same road. 
you are doing this, I'm doing this. One gets to work. They say resumption time is 8 o'clock. One gets to work every day at, at 8.30. One gets to work at 7.30. On the topic of punctuality coming early, who will the boss like the most? The one that comes by 7.30. Why? Because, because it comes earlier. What does it mean? It's punctual. Thank you. It means that what? He takes his job more seriously. That is what I'm looking for. The boss will be happier with the one that comes early because he says he takes his job what? Seriously. He's more serious than the other one. Then when they now start working, one always has an excuse for not doing his work. They say, oh God, why have, have you put all the documents in the file? Have you done your work? Uh, ah, actually today, sir, as I was not about to carry the file, it just started raining outside. The boss will say, okay, if it was raining outside, you, you are inside. So it was raining outside, as it was now raining. And now say, ah, let me quickly make a cup of tea. Because I'm feeling, I was feeling cold. And now, uh, so I have not... But there is another one. Have you done your job? Yes, it's done. Have you filed the documents? Yes, it's filed. The boss goes to check it. Everything is there. Who will he love more? The one that does his job. Why? Still using Bro Ayo's ex uh, statement. Because he takes his job more seriously. Why? Is it important for the boss that his subordinates takes his job, their job seriously? Because they are serving him, yes. But there is, I want us to touch on something important. Because what? It will make the company grow, yes. But there is something more delicate than that. The company has a goal in mind. Yes. You are very close to it, but I want you to touch on something. Because actually, the survival of the company depends on the employees. No matter how big a company is, and you put all the tables, the chairs, who will make it work? It's the people. It's the people you employ. I remember my on my first job, I got a, my first job in a consulting firm. And the first whole, first month, first 30 days, was on, we were on training. So different people would come, they would train us. And very high sounding things. And we would write, you know, we were very young. We would write, they said, now this company that you have joined is a very serious organization. Ah, we said we are in trouble. So, you know, we would take notes, we were ready. Then on the last day, the overall boss, he never showed up from the first day. The last day of the training, he showed up. And I will never forget, that's how you know when a boss, a real boss speaks to you. You will never forget. The few minutes he spent with you, you will never forget. And then he came and stood in front of us. Put his hand like this. That was, that was his usual way. He said, you young folks that have come to join us, I want to ask you, just one question and I will be done. So imagine how we were all very serious. This was a very top shot, you know. So we were ready. He said, Why do companies fail? Ha! Hey, come and see analysis. We all started. When the production capacity is this and this, you know, so the consulting firm. So we all, we all we wanted to sound like consultants. Say, when the production capacity um, is lower than the market demand. So, he stood there and was looking. We end up finished. He said, okay. Say, you, why the company? Say, when we look at skills, competence, and future, we all started speaking high sounding words. You will say, okay, well, okay, you two, you have said your own. Then he went round. So, before he gets to you, ah, your brain would have calculated very big words. We wanted to impress him. So, we all spoke. He got to me, I spoke very high sounding words too. And you, I was looking. If I was trying to see if he was impressed. The old man, he was an old man, he was already close to 60 at that time. The man would look at you, okay. Say you, say you. We all spoke, you know, after everything. He said, I have, he said, well, you all tried. You are very young. 
You don't know anything yet. Now that is what I say, you don't know anything yet. The answer is just one word, if I will give you a clue. Why do companies, companies fail? Why do businesses collapse? He said, I will give you the answer. He said this one word, people. He said it's people. It's people that makes companies succeed. It's people that makes companies fail. It's all about people. It is what they do. Some people employ some good, hard-working people. Put them in a small shop, they will make millions there. Employ lazy people. Put AC in a big room, they will, still, they will not work. The success of an organization, of a company, of a business, depends on the people. It depends on what they do. Do you know that it's not different in the kingdom of God? That also, the advancement of the kingdom of Christ depends on us. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know that in our generation, in our time, how much people come to Christ does not depend on God, it depends on us. It depends on how serious we are. It depends on how much we are ready to do. And that's why the Bible says, in our service to God, we must not be swapped. Is it, is it making sense to you now? That's why God says, don't be slothful. Because the advancement of the kingdom, what God wants to achieve in this time, depends on us. So if you don't do anything, nothing will happen. What God wants to, uh, to achieve will also not be achieved. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So, God wants us to be committed. As we serve God with our lives, as we serve God in His house, we must be committed. We must have deep commitment. And what is deep commitment? Huh? What are the things that show deep commitment? And I'm going to give you five points, five important points that shows deep commitment in your service to God. Number one, what shows that you are deeply committed in your service to God? Number one, it is shown, it is shown in being active. Being active and not waiting to be pushed, to be pressurized or to be begged to suffer. These are the things that show zeal, that show that you are committed. Being active. Are you active in your service to God? The responsibility you have in the house of God, are you active? Or do they have to chase you and say, Ah, eh, Sister Balale, have you done it? Brother John, have you done what you are supposed to do? No. It shows that you are not zealous, you are not committed. The one that is committed, the first thing, the first sign that you will see is that they are active. They are not waiting for anybody to beg them. They are not waiting for anybody to push them. Imagine if I had to beg Brother Joseph to set up the equipment. Imagine if I have to beg Brian to manage the audiovisual, set up the projector. Then I'm in trouble. I will spend the whole Sunday begging everybody. Imagine if I have to beg the members of the choir so that they can sing and back up. Then it shows that the people are not committed. They are not zealous. The first sign of zeal is action. Tell your neighbor the first sign of zeal. The first sign of zeal. Open your mouth. Say it again. The first sign of zeal. Do we have to beg you and push you and pressurize you? Then you are not zealous. It is zealous people that will be blessed. It's not just those who serve. The first thing is activity. They are active. They do what they are supposed to do. They do what is expected of them. They are active. That's why the Bible says, not slothful in business. Fallent in spirit. They are alive. They are active. Can you give me the NLT? But not slothful. I didn't say you should change your Give me NLT. 12 11.
So there are a lot of people that are not active. You give them a responsibility, you have to be chasing after them. Ah, brother, have you done it? Sister, that thing. That means you are not zealous. Don't let your leader ever run after you. And you see this. This makes it even clearer. What's the first statement? Never be lazy. Never be lazy. Nobody likes being told that you are lazy. How many people like that? If someone looks at you and says, you are lazy. Do you feel happy? You feel insulted at times. But you might be lazy. Because to be lazy means you are slothful. You are not moving as fast as you should. Say, so don't be lazy. Never be lazy. But work hard. Fabulous in spirit means you do what? You work hard. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Serve the Lord. Let energy, let life be bouncing inside you. I was observing the choir. I always observe your online rehearsals. And I was following the trend. Send voice notes. And you did not send it. Most of you did not send it. That's your fault. It's not a good thing. That's your fault. Those things are important to God, in case you don't know. The way you move, how quickly you act as a child of God, in your service to God, is important to God. Because at times, the success or failure of the thing is not even whether you know how to do it, it, is in, it might be in the timing. For you to have done it well, at the right time. I'll give you an example. Some of us have been driving now for 20 years or more. Do you understand? And you are driving. Something obstructs your way. What do you do? What do you do to the pedals? You, you press the brake, Abby. Whether you will hit the object that has obstructed you or you will stop before hitting it. All things being equal, the car is in perfect condition. What determines it? How fast you react in, in pressing the brake? Your brake might be good, but if you don't press it on time, you can still run into an object. Am I making sense to you? Timing is very important to God. How quickly you move when you are supposed to move. How quickly you do things that you are supposed to do. That's why in the business world, they say effectiveness and efficiency. You can be effective. You know what to do. But you also have to be effective, to be, to be efficient. To be efficient means you do it at the right time. Not slothful in business. You must never, in this church, we must never be found to be slothful. We are not slothful people. We are not lazy people. When you are supposed to do something, you do it. To time, even ahead of time. So the first sign of zeal, the first sign of commitment, is activity. Number two, the second sign of commitment lies in timing. Let somebody say timing. timing. I can't hear you say it very well. Timing. timing. And I've almost spoken about it already. First is that you are active. The second is that you are timely. You do things on time. Do you know that in the corporate world, people get sacked for poor timing? You can lose your job, a great job, because your timing is poor. You don't meet up to deadlines. And I'll give you an example. For instance, as an accountant, there is a day in the month that latest on social date you must file your returns to the authority. Once you don't file it on that day, there will be penalty. Let me give you one that is very interesting. In the corporate world, there are filings you make, you make to the tax authorities. 
There is a particular filing in Nigeria, they call it transfer pricing filing. You gather all your records, you run all the analysis, you do it once a year, but there is a date that is the deadline. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Give me a date that we we'll use as the deadline. Say 25th of July. Do you understand? Once you don't submit that document on the 25th of July, according to the laws of Nigeria, this Nigeria that we are in, once you don't submit that document on that deadline day, say it's 25th, you understand? Once it's 26th, the company will pay a penalty of 10 million naira. I'm telling you this authoritatively. That company will pay a penalty of how much? 10 million naira. I am saying this to you authoritatively. It is not whether what you wrote inside is right or wrong. They are still going to check what you submitted. But that is not even the first issue. The first issue is, did he submit before the deadline? They said deadline is 25th. They are waiting. Once that 25th passes and you are on the 26th, it's 10 million flat. Before they even check whether you want your road inside, is right or wrong. That is how delicate timing is. So imagine you are the boss. You are the owner of that company. You now employ a slothful staff, an employee, some, a, a worker, for that, someone that works in your company. You put him in charge of that filing. And he's a, la he's a lazy person. He's always dragging. He always has an excuse. And then um, the time to file on that 25th, he says, Eh, you know, I was very hungry. And I quickly went out to buy biscuit. As I was not buying biscuit, it now started to rain. So as it was now raining, I now said, let me wait small. As I was now waiting small, there was now flood. As the flood was now moving, there was now no bus. Then as there was now no bus, I was now waiting. Then I now look, it was 7 p.m. Of course, I went to. When I now came back on the 26th, this is the final. What will you do? Eh, what will you do? Be frank. Thank you. You sound like your dad. What will you be if you are the boss? Let me ask, let me make it clear to you because the reason why you are still smiling is because you don't understand. Who will pay the 10 million? Is it the employee? Who will pay it? The boss. So somebody has just created 10 million naira business for you. And you must wait. Or else they will shut down your business. Somebody, because of his carelessness, has just created 10 million naira debt for you. Will you be happy with him? That is how important timing is. Now, because in the spirit, we don't see what is always going on, there are also penalties in the spirit. When you don't do spiritual things on time, you are penalized. You just might not know if you are not sensitive. Let me tell you, if you want to know what happens to you, many times you are supposed to ascend to a particular height spiritually. You feel it, but after a while, you see that you don't attain to that height. And that feeling of, ah, I'm supposed to rise, it just leaves you after a while. You have made a loss. Something has happened. There is something you are supposed to do that you have not done. And that's why, as a child of God, you are just sitting down on your own one day. You suddenly receive a nudging. Fast tomorrow. Fast for the next three, next three days. Don't say, eh, I reject it in Jesus' name. No. God might want to just do something in your life. He wants you to create an atmosphere that the spirit will be able to move. And if you don't do it, you are penalized. Many times an evil is coming. The Lord says, start fasting. You cannot see that evil. But the Lord sees it. He says, fast, pray, push the evil away. He says, ah, Buddha Chai said, for you, ah, that effort that I just made is very nice. Let me finish this pot of soup. Okay. Shall it is that when everything is okay that you can finish your pot of soup? Timing is crucial. Do you do the things you are supposed to do on time? 
Your service to God, do you just serve or you do it on time? God looks at those things because they are important to you. Number three, how do you know that a person is committed? No carelessness. Let somebody say no carelessness. A committed person is not a careless person. You know some people do things carelessly. You tell them to put this light on the on the tripod stand. They will not screw everything very well. They are careless. A little breeze will blow. The, the tripod stand will fall down with the light. The light will break. The person is what? Talk to me. Some people are angry now. First of all, we are not going to answer you. If you like, don't answer. I will answer myself. I've been preaching for almost 30 years. I'm not moved. There is nothing. Do your face like this. I'm not moved. I will tell you the truth. Are the ones that help you. They are the ones that push you forward. My work as your pastor is to do what? To push you forward so that your life will have a meaning. And one of the instrumentality of pushing you forward is the truth. I must speak the truth to you. Let somebody say amen. amen. Say, Pastor, we hear you. Amen. And if you like, be angry. Hallelujah. Amen. No carelessness. Never lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord. A committed person is not careless. You don't give a committed person work to do and, and they are really careless. You don't give them the projector and they slap it on the floor. You don't give them the keyboard and they slap it on the floor. You don't give them the microphone and they slap it on the floor. Some people are very careless. Whatever work you give them, you will be afraid. Hey, will they not spoil this thing? Will they not spoil? No, that's not a committed person. It's a sign that the person does not have zeal. His heart is not in the work of God. God blesses those whose heart are in his work. Are you a careless person? You see this scripture? Unfortunately, we don't have too many translations, but I'm going to give you two translations. There is a translation called the American Standard Bible. It says, okay, no, I'm not even using this scripture. Let me give you another scripture. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 48. Under carelessness. A committed person is not a careless person. When a person is committed, he handles the work of God carefully. You don't do it carelessly. You handle it carefully. A committed person is not careless. He's very careful. He makes sure that he handles equipment, he handles people, and he even speaks carefully. Jeremiah chapter 48 verse 10. 10. Verse 10. Just one verse back. Can you give me King James. Look at this scripture. It's a very dangerous scripture. This will not be your story in the name of Jesus. Amen. Say good amen. This will not be your story in Jesus' name. Amen. But look at the Bible because I have to tell you the truth. Even when it's hard. Because the truth is not always palatable. Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 10. Look at this scripture. He says, Cursed be he that what? That doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. And cause be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. That is being active, fighting for the Lord. I'm not looking at this, I'm looking at the first sentence. Cause be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. And I'm going to look at two different translations. There is a translation called the American Standard Bible. It says, Cause be he that doeth the work of the Lord negligently. What does it mean to be negligent? To be careless. I like the way we say it in Nigeria. I don't care attitude. You know people have I don't care attitude. I like the way we say it. You know? When you have an I don't care attitude, they say, your work is to clean the chair. You take the dust and you don't do it like this. So somebody comes to church in white and he sits on it. And the whole dress is messed up. Will the person be happy? Will the person bless you? He won't bless you. 
because you have handled your work negligently, carelessly. It's called, they say, it's, I don't care attitude, whatever wants to happen will happen. Let me tell you, people who do the work of God like that, they will not be blessed. God will bless those who undo his work carefully, with a lot of concern, making sure that everything goes well. Oh, thank you. Oh, we have ASV. Amazing. Say, cause be he that do the work of Jehovah negligently. You will not be cursed in Jesus' name. Amen. The work of God, I always tell people who are close to me, the work of God is very delicate, it's very dangerous. At times, it's even better not to touch it than to do it carelessly. You will be blessed. Amen. You will not be cursed. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. There is another translation called the Young's Literal Translation. The Young Literal Translation says, Cause disease that handles the work of God slothfully. You remember that slothfully in business? Slothfully. Lazily. They are always late. They never do things effectively. God is unhappy with it. God's blessings does not rest on such people. May God's blessings rest on you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So that's the third way. When you want to see a man that is committed, he does not handle the work of God carelessly. He handles it with a lot of care. Some people handle the work of God and then wherever it wants to end, let it end. No. When we pray, we go back to timing. Some of us in our offices, we are never late. In our offices, ah, they know us. Always punctual. But in the church, never punctual. We always have a reason why we will come late to church, come late to the things of God, but we never have the same reason to go late to work. Because we fear our employees. Let us also fear them. Point number four. How do you know that a person is committed? By taking initiatives. By taking initiatives. What does it mean to take initiative? To do the right thing, even when you have not been told. I'll give you an example. Imagine if Robert is in charge of the drums, as he is. Then, as he's taking care of the drums after the service or before the service, he then sees one of the children get hold of an expensive microphone and wants to throw it. And he looks with the corner of his eye. It's not my work. My own work is to take care of the drums. Ordinarily, by common sense, what is he supposed to do? He's supposed to stop the child. He's supposed to take action. He's supposed to protect the equipment. But he says, it's not my business, so that's someone that does not take initiative. But the brother that I know will take initiative. He will say, ah, no, no, no. Doing the right things, even when you have not been told. The service ends. You see two people carrying the equipment, and you are just relaxed. There is nothing that stops you from joining them. Join them, help them. You come into the service earlier than everybody. You say, well, I'm not the pastor, and I'm not in the ushering team. Since the ushers are not here, it's their business to arrange the hall, and the chairs are there. Take initiative, arrange. Do something that you can also do. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. When we do these things, blessings come upon our lives. Whether you know it or not. Whether you even expect the blessings or not. Should I tell you something? Like I said at the beginning, one of the things that brings the greatest blessings upon our lives is how we serve God. I'm telling you the truth under God. And many times, you do not even have to pray for those blessings. You have met the requirements. Am I making sense to you? You have done what you are supposed to do. And naturally, the blessings will come after you. That's why if you are given to serving God, there are certain victories you will see in your life you will be wondering when you prayed. You will be wondering. Let me tell you something. I say this authoritatively and humbly before God. I have seen a lot of victories in my life. 
I'm telling you the truth, Lord God. I'm not boasting. I've seen a lot of victories in my life. And do you know the only place I can trace it to? Serving God. With every, I serve God with everything in me. That is where I trace a lot of the blessings in my life and the victories I've enjoyed in my life. Even when I don't know people, God will stir up the heart of people to help me. I told you the story of when I went for an interview. I wanted the role so badly. I was in a difficult time, going through a difficult time in my life. So we went, and there were several of us. And you know, knockout series. They were knocking people out, knocking people out. Ah, I will go back home and pray, Lord. I'm still in the race. Then, out of the several people, we were left with two. Ah, you can imagine the kind of prayer I was praying at that time. If only I used to, I pray fire prayer, I would have prayed fire for the other person. But I don't even know the kind of prayer it was doing. Anyways, I was praying and trusting God. But interestingly, you know, God is very interesting. I needed that job so badly at that time. When the final decision was taken, they gave it to the other person. We were the two of us, so a long grace. Many people had dropped on the way. They did not say he was the one that was successful. Do you think I would like to you to say every time I would? No. After, I mean, for me to have even come that long, it shows that they, it shows that they saw something in me. But hear me. They said he was the one that they wanted, so they gave him the job. I came back home. I started giving praise to God. That's how I am. I was giving praise to God. Lord, I bless you. Lord, I glorify you. Lord, I magnify you. When some of us, our hearts would have raged against God, they go! Where are you? God! Not only can you cut off your hand, you can cut off your head. <laughs> That's not how to talk to God. So as they told me now, after the long battle, for weeks, I give you all the glory. I give you all. My heart was in pain. Don't think I don't think. I was feeling the pain. The devil was saying, you better curse God. I said, shut you, shut up. If I curse God, do you have a blessing you want to give me? <laughs> do you have, can you make the situation better? I give you all the glory. I give you honor. I give you all the glory. I give you honor. I give you all the glory. I give you honor. I came back home. I started praising God. I told my wife, she's here sitting. I said, they've given the job to the other person. But we give God praise. Pain was in my heart. Praise was in my mouth. Pain was in my heart. Praise was in my mouth. I said, what do they want to do? I said, I know. They said, yes, actually, um, like we informed you, we have given the role to another person. I was thinking, like, maybe the person rejected the role. I said, so he didn't reject it. He took it. He also wanted it. Say, but there is another role. We have, after the long interview, we have decided that we still want you in this organization. So we have created a role for you. What would I trace that to? I didn't know anybody in that organization. It's only traceable to my service to God. Serve God. Serve Him in a way that He will bless you. Against all odds. Let me tell you, there are times in your life that your odds will be against you. It will seem as if you can't succeed. It will seem as if you can't survive a situation. You know what will come through for you? Your service to God. Serve God. Not slothful in business. Fabulous in spirit. Serve the Lord. Giving Him everything. Blessings will come after you after some time. So, point number four. You want to be a committed man. It takes initiative. And finally, and that's where I'm going to stop this morning. A committed man is unmovable. Unmovable, unshakable. I'll tell you what that means. When a man is committed, he's not moved by anything. Because as you serve God, there will be things that will want to move you and make you change your mind. Hallelujah. One of the things that can move you will be other people. A man that is committed to the service of God is not moved by the actions of others. Because you can look at others. They can start acting in the wrong way. 
If care is not taken, you know, psychologists spoke about, sociologists spoke about group behavior. They say many times, when people are in a group, what they do as a group is not a function of what they would, they would have done as individuals. They only follow the crowd. Do you understand what I'm saying? How many of us have been in a riot before? And as the riot is going on, you also join them. We don't go green. I'll do that continue. Then suddenly, some of the people leading the mob says, look at this bus, the school bus. We will burn it. And they set it on fire. And they burn it. Who burns the school bus? The, the whole group. Am I making sense to you? I'm going somewhere. If they want to say, they burn the school bus. We they only catch the person that set it on fire. They will carry all the rioters. They will move out of you and say you burnt the bus. Ordinarily, you that you are just at the back carrying placards with them. Could you have set the bus on fire if you are on your own? Am I making sense to you? You must understand that if you are a committed person, you must not be moved by people. People's actions. At times, some people will decide not to serve God. It must not move you from your own service. In the service of God, I don't look at people. They say it's prayer meeting. Others don't come. They don't join. It does not stop you from joining. Their action or their inaction does not affect you. You are unmovable. At times also, other people's attitude some people don't act well, they have bad attitude to the things of God. If care is not taken, their attitude will rub off on you too. You too, without thinking, you start acting like them. But a committed man takes his stand. Everybody might go this way. This is what God wants me to do. That's what I will do. A committed man is not moved by the words of people. You know as you are serving God, those who are not serving God can start poking jokes at you. Ah, uh, You don't know. You wake up, you are dressing up, you, you carry your Bible. They say, ah, your roommate says, Mary, mother of Jesus, you are going to church again. Eh? Mary, the mother of Jesus. Do you know that if care is not taken, you can become short for us. You start saying, ah, it seems like my own is too much. When the blessings come, will you say it's too much? Let me tell you, I remember back on campus. Um, the school that I went to, the campus, where we used to fellowship was outside the campus, but not too far away. The furniture we used, the benches, were on campus. These were terrible, terribly heavy wood. And we had no fellowship bus. And we had no money to rent. So the group I joined was the organizing group. When it's fellowship time, we'll go to campus. We'll carry the benches on our heads. Do you know how embarrassing that is on campus? You carry benches on your head. Eh? A whole big boy like me. A whole big girl like me. You now put benches on. And you have to walk across the campus where people are on the parks, at the buttery, drinking, chatting, your classmates. Then you walk with nature again because you, you are serving God. But the fellowship did not have money. And God spoke to me specifically that I should join that group. In fact, there was a time I said, I don't want, I've done one year in this group. Can I go somewhere? He said, No, that's the group you'll be. I ended up my four years on campus. I was in that group. Even till my final, in fact, in my final year, they made me the head of the group. Bench carriers on my head across the campus. Some people will laugh at us. Some people will shrink at us. Ah, what's wrong with these people? Do you, do you have to go that far? Am I not the one that says I want to serve them? I speak to you boldly today. Most of the people that they carry those benches, they are nowhere close to where I'm standing today. Listen, when you serve God faithfully, God blesses you in a big way. Doors will open for you that you, your brain cannot open by itself. Doors will open that your connections cannot open. 
because you have served him faithfully. A life that is on fire for God is a life that will be greatly blessed in the future. I'm telling you the truth. So you must understand that when you are now in your service to God, there will be opportunities for you to be discouraged. There will be opportunities for you to go the way of others. Don't take that opportunity. And that's where I'm going to end this morning. A faithful man will abound in blessing. A man that serves God faithfully is not moved. Nothing can move him. Listen, friends, let nothing move you. Let's close with this scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The projector is upside. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Just press that little bit. Let's see. First Corinthians, let somebody read for me. Therefore, Therefore my, beloved brethren, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that, as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. In that your labor, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Bible says, be steadfast, be unmovable. Let nothing move you. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You must always be doing the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that all the things you are doing is what? Is not in vain. Tell your neighbor, my labor, my labor of Lord is, is not in vain. Everything I do for God is not in vain. Hallelujah. Amen. Your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. And because your labor will be rewarded, the Bible says be unmovable. Let nothing move you. Anything that wants to change your commitment to God, it wants to steal away your blessing. Am I making sense to you? I'm going to say it again. Anything that wants to move you away from your service to God and says, hey, nobody is doing it. Why are you even doing it? I don't even appreciate it. <laughs> Joseph, the father of Jesus. <laughs> Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let me tell you. Everything that is doing that to you wants to steal your future blessing. Don't allow it. How do you not allow it? Be unmovable. Let not move you. Be steadfast. Stand firm. Can you give me an LT? I want the New Living Translation. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you have an LT, please get it from me. Be steadfast. Be firm. Be unmovable. Let nothing should be able to move you. If you are truly committed to God, if your life is on fire for God, nothing should be able to move you. Who has an LT? New Living Translation. That's where I want to end the message. Where are all the Bible apps? Fifteen fifty-eight. Why? 
For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. There is nothing you do for God that is useless. Ah, but I'm coming from a far place and I'm using my money on transport. It's not useless. God is still going to bless you for it. Oh, I'm serving God, but others are not serving him. Don't look at them. Look to God because God will still bless you. Oh, I am serving God and nobody is appreciating it. Don't look at them. Look to God because God is going to appreciate it after a while. Let your life be on fire for God. Take initiative. Don't be slothful in business. Don't let people beg you or push you or harass you before you serve. Don't be moved by other people. What they do or what they do not do. Be committed. Be efficient. Don't be the old ever late one. That always have an excuse for not doing things right. And the Lord help us. Let's pray. Lord, prepare. I'll send you a